are trying to cause trouble. And you, we, we understand that this stuff, this kind of stuff has legs because they only want to believe awful stuff. Councillor, I'm sorry you're going through that right now. It's, it's not acceptable. It's not right. And, uh, it's well, you difficult. know what it's like, Chief. I know you know what it's like, so. I'm sorry you're yeah. going through that. Yeah, I know. As long as I have your support, everyone, thank you. I have a meeting to order. This is a continuation of the meeting from yesterday, November 23rd. Mm -hmm. And Carol Ann, I heard you. I'm sorry uh, that that is happening. Um, uh, we have a responsibility as a board to work through difficult issues with the community. And um, hopefully we can get to a more respectful place in the future where we don't have these kinds of issues. Uh, tonight we are dealing, our first <laughs> is the continuation of the consideration of the 2021 budget. Um, last night uh, when we recessed for the evening, we had not called the uh, two members of council who had registered to speak. So I have offered them both an opportunity to address the meeting today first. Uh, so if they're on the line, I'm going to call on Riley Brockington to address the uh, board now. Madam Chair, can you hear me? We can indeed. Go ahead, Riley. Thank you, Chair. Um, so good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Slowly and all other guests. Thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, at your two-day budget hearing for the 2021 budget. My name is Riley Brockington, the Councillor for River Ward. The residents and business owners of my ward appreciate the work that the auto police service does in our city. However, they also recognize that important reforms are needed and needed now. Following significant public outcry, particularly in 2020, as a result of tragic incidents in North America between the police and private citizens, some of which lost their lives, I issued a public statement this past spring that acknowledged the existence of systematic racism within our society, including our police services. And I'm committed like you are to supporting immediate changes that will address a number of chronic systematic issues. Earlier in June, my colleague, Councillor King wrote in the Ottawa Citizen, quote, Canadians ought not make the assumption that our country has not been impacted by the same currents of racial injustice and entrenched systematic inequality. Canada is also confronted by the same major and historical challenges which include anti-Black racism, police brutality, the controversial practice of carding, and the wide economic disparities encountered by Indigenous communities and people of color, end quote. He is correct. First, I wish to state that we as a society need the police, full stop. Police culture needs to change. And although challenging to do so, even an aircraft carrier can turn around. It does not happen fast, but it can be done and it must be done. The board must encourage the chief to preserve the good and root out the bad. Second, major reforms are needed. While budget 2021 provides resources for some new initiatives that takes baby steps forward, much more is needed. I am a huge proponent of proactive actions to avoid more invasive, more costly, more damaging outcomes in the future. The basic premise of defunding the police is something that I understand and believe we need to model more towards in that, as Patrick Sharkey, sorry, Patrick Sharkey, a professor at Princeton states, quote, when neighborhood organizations engage young people with well-run after-school activities and summer job programs, those young people are dramatically less likely to be involved in crime. When local organizations reclaimed abandoned lots and turned them into green spaces, violence falls. When community nonprofits proliferate across a city, the city becomes safer. And when we ask community organizations and leaders to take over the responsibility for creating a safe community, they should be given the equivalent resources to do so. As a city councilor, I acknowledge, recognize, and support grassroots, locally-based, community-driven programs and services in our communities. Policing by its nature is reactive, it's expensive, and not always community building. So reflecting on the, on the most recent election campaign in the States, President-elect Biden said he supports the urgent need for reform. 
And even Bernie Sanders calls for reforms, not, a, not abolishment. Quote, Sanders says, quote, I think we want to redefine what police departments do, give them the support they need to make their jobs better defined. Uh, well-trained, well-educated professionals in police departments, end of quote. So what's the challenge for me as a counselor? Without knowing where the OPS is headed, it's difficult for decision makers to make drastic decisions on the budget. In the same breath, continuing with the status quo or a slightly different version of the status quo ignores those screaming for much needed reforms. Simply put, this is not a win-win budget for all residents of Ottawa. So I'm gonna ask for three things, Madam Chair. First is, I ask that you reduce the new hires in 2021 from 30 to 10. If council gives the authority for 30, hire 10 and use the extra funding for community-based programs and services, proactive supports. The second thing I ask for, publicly share the mandate, annual objectives, performance measure metrics for the neighborhood response teams. These have widely been uh, embraced by members of council and the community, but even after a year, uh, a lot of what they do is still unknown. And I've asked the chief and, and others for this very important data. And finally, reach out to city council for two sessions in 2021 that provide a genuine opportunity to learn about the OPS, the direction you're headed in the short term, the vision for the long term, how you plan to get there, the challenges that may be encountered, and how the Ottawa Police Service Board and City Council can work better together going forward. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to address the Police Services Board uh, this evening. Well, thank you very much, Councillor Brockington, for being here with us this evening and for your comments. Um, I just wanted to um, um, reply to the three asks that you have. The first one to reduce new hires from 30 to 10. We are considering a motion tonight that is a variation of that. It basically uh, asks that um, before the new hires are made that the um, Police consult with um, neighborhood uh, community groups and come back with a plan of new hires that would be a mix of perhaps some sworn officers and some other um, professionals in the community, such as mental health workers or youth outreach workers or the like. Um, and so um, before those were hired, uh, the police would come back with uh, a comprehensive draft plan that uh, would ultimately be approved by the board um, that would establish uh, the new hires and who would they would be. But uh, instead of in the past where they would all be sworn officers, uh, this year they would be a mix of something that I think uh, is more reflective of what the community is looking for. So that's the first one. The second one, uh, publicly share the metrics for the NRTs. I'm looking at Steve Bell, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't publicly share that. So we will. And the third one, reach out to city council for two sessions, um, uh, sort of educational sessions and maybe lunch bag sessions on, on um, the police service. And I would be happy to do that. I think that makes absolute sense. So thank you very much, Councillor Brockington for your thoughtful input. And uh, we're always happy to see you at the police services board. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you to all members of the board. Thank you. Will anyone else have any questions or comments for Riley? No. Seeing none, did, did Matt Flurry join the call? I know all the members of council are super busy right now. So unfortunately, it appears that Councillor Flurry uh, has not been able to join us. And they were the only two members of council that had registered at this time to address the board. So we're now going to open the floor for questions uh, to the um, service from members of the board regarding uh, the 2021 budget. So who would like to start? Jadines, can I? Yes, please, um, <clears throat> go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Jadines. Uh, 
So with your permission, uh, I have I have two questions to the chief and uh, to yourself. So first is concerning following the yesterday's uh, delegations. So that is this is to the chief, and then I will be coming to the budget one. Is it okay uh, to proceed? Thank you. Uh, Chief, uh, yesterday we heard from many delegations about the pain and suffering they had to undergo during the service action in the early hours of Saturday, November 21st, when these protesters were removed. They had no service has properly documented this planned action by the OPS, such as videotaping minutes, planning and execution of removal of these protesters. I believe that is the protocol for any major event at the OPS. Um, Sorry. You cut out a little bit and we didn't hear your whole question. So I'm just going to ask you to repeat it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief, yesterday we heard from many delegations about the pain and suffering they had to undergo during the service action in the early hours of Saturday, November 21st, when these protesters were removed. There have been some conflicting views emanating from both sides. I would like to know if the service has properly documented this planned action by the OPS, such as videotaping minutes, planning and execution of removal of these protesters. I believe that is a protocol for any major event at the OPS. That's correct, Member Nerman, yes. Thank you. Uh, so Chair, uh, this is my uh, second uh, concerning the budget. Uh, Madam Chair, I would like to offer a few observations based on yesterday's discussions of the police budget. It is obvious that in the present conditions that policing finds itself in, there is considerable interest in policing and the resources being devoted to it. <clears throat> As a board, we represent the public's interest in the function of policing in the city of Ottawa. And as a board member, I do want to state very clearly that I recognize the important role and function that Ottawa Police Service plays in our community. And despite some very real challenges that we continue to address, the OPS does make this city better for, for us all. I understand that as a police budget is such a large component of the city's budget, we tend to focus on it. Having said that, the larger goal for us all is a safe, healthy, and inclusive community. And that requires the coordination of efforts in sectors well beyond policing. Social services, the health and mental health systems, education, housing, to name only a few. I don't want us to lose sight of our role as a board to advance these discussions as well. Otherwise, the singular focus on policing will be of a limited value. <clears throat> Today, we will be voting on the budget that was presented to us yesterday as a final product. And yet, we heard a number of community voices that were looking for an opportunity to influence and provide input into that document. The reality is the majority of the police budget represent fixed and inflationary cost. The salaries of our civilian and SWAN members, the cost of equipment and fuel there is very, very little that is discretionary in the budget for us to debate when it is presented in this format. And yet, there can be a role for greater public input and comment on policing and the role of the Ottawa Police Service through the budget process. Madam Chair, the next year, that is 2021 budget, I would like us to consider as a board how we might be able to do this in coordination with the chief and his team. For example, <clears throat> we have heard the concerns of advocates around the police response to gender-based crimes such as sexual assault and domestic violence. Can we have a discussion on what the community expectations are of the police response in this area and then consider a zero-based budgeting approach to right-size these units and the resources they are provided? Hate crimes, have community impacts far beyond those that are directly affected and they can produce other forms of intolerance and 
incivility in our community. Can we have a discussion on what the public expects the police response to be and what that would cost as a portion of the police budget? Road safety has always been a key issue for many neighborhoods. What should the traffic enforcement response be from the Ottawa police? What standard of enforcement and police intervention are we willing to pay for or do we want to recommend other options such as red light cameras and photo radars? Madam Chair, what are the community's priority safety issues? What is their expected level of service? And then how much would that actually cost to provide? Are we willing to accept a lesser level of service in one area to bolster our response in another? We are in the midst of a business planning cycle. It seems natural for me that we would look to have these more specific discussions with the community on the plan with a view to informing the next police budget. This education and interactions with the community and other stakeholders going forward for our 2021 budget is very critical and important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mender, Member Nerman. There was a lot in there. Um, I heard a lot of good suggestions. Some of it I think we would capture through our strategic planning exercise that we will start. Um, some of it I think we will need to discuss with the chief how we might uh, change some of the discussions that we have and um, you know, some of what you were talking about is service level standards, and some of that might be in the purview of Ottawa City Council, especially when it comes to things like the placement of red light cameras. Or um, So I think there's a lot to look at there, but um, if you can make sure that we have a copy of that inquiry, uh, we can follow up on it and try and come with a path forward. So uh, thank, thank you. I will definitely send it to Krista. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Member Sueda. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is for, uh, for uh, CEO uh, Jeff Letourneau. Um, I just want to reconfirm my understanding of the budget. Um, can, you, can you please outline what, what amount of this budget is due to inflation? Thank you, uh, Member Sueda. Um, in terms of the $13.2 million increase, um, $11.3 million is related to both price inflation and wage inflation. There's a further $1.7 million included in the growth category that relates to wage, um, annualized wages for the 30 uh, growth officers that were hired in 2020. So when you include those two numbers together, that equates to $13 million of the 13.2 million increase is related to, um, is related to inflation. Okay, so uh, just to, to make it a little bit simple, um, so basically 11.3 million is inflation for, for a couple of reasons. Now, I think primarily that number is made up of um, are the, the staff, the employees at the OPS, is that correct? That's, that's correct. $8.8 .8 million of the 11.3 that was identified is related to uh, compensation uh, and wage increases. Okay, now does that mean that we have contractual obligations that we have to adhere to? Yes, uh, what, all of those, all of those uh, wage increases are related to negotiated um, contractual arrangements um, with, uh, with both associations, the OPA and the SOA. Okay, and that's done through the uh, collective uh, bargaining? Correct. Okay. So the difference between the 11.3 and the 13.2, which is say roughly 2 million, what is that amount for? Well, there's uh, $3.9 million in, in growth costs. Um, that can be further broken down 
uh, 1.7 of that 3.9 is related to the 30 growth officers that were hired in 2020. That's the annualization um, of their of their uh, of their uh, compensation costs. The remainder, 2.2 million, is related to the um, uh, costs associated with the 30 growth hires forecasted for 2021. There's a further $900,000 in new services. That's made up of the $1.5 million, uh, $1 million for the mental health um, uh, contracted services uh, consultation. That's partially offset by a provincial grant of a million dollars. Uh, the sexual violence and harassment project is targeted at uh, $180,000 and additional de-escalation uh, and intercultural competency anti-racism training is, is costed at two, a little over $200,000. There's an additional $2.7 million of efficiencies, which are savings. These are base budget reductions that, uh, that reduce the total uh, size of the budget increase. And then there's a small amount of $150,000 of uh, revenue increases uh, for user fees. Okay, so the new services or new initiatives, uh, mental health, uh, de-escalation training, and there was a third one as well, the sexual uh, harassment and, and violence. Sorry, Mr. Swade, I missed that. I missed that question. I uh, just want to see that there's there's three new initiatives that the uh, OPS would like to take on: uh, a mental health component, a sexual harassment component, and a de-escalation component. That's, that's correct. That's correct. And those are, those are all funded in the new services category and the total net incremental funding requirement um, is, is $900,000 out of that 13.2 million increase. Okay. Uh, just, question. Uh, member Sueda, just to add on to, the, to that, um, within the 30 uh, growth positions in 2021, 20 of those will go to expand the neighborhood resource teams to the suburban and rural areas of the city. So that is an expansion of the neighborhood policing program to align with the board's priority around advancing community policing. Five of those positions will go to add an additional five crime prevention officers. Again, that advances our ability to deliver community policing, neighborhood policing across the city, but particularly in the rural and suburban areas. Two positions, five additional positions go into our sexual assault and, and uh, partner assault. They're investigators to address uh, victims of sexual assault, domestic abuse, child abuse. They will support human traffic investigations and related investigations. Two of them will actually be coordinator positions. One that has been requested by the uh, uh, Violence Against Women community as a coordinator for our activities in relation to that larger stakeholder group in the community. And one will be the coordinator for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So there are line item uh, budget financial dollars to advance three critical initiatives. The growth positions will advance additional critical initiatives to support all of which supports the board's priorities. Okay. And what is your long-term goal to developing these areas? in particular mental health, sexual harassment, and de-escalation de training. What's the long-term goal here? Um, let me start with um, the um, sexual assault, sorry, the uh, workplace sexual violence and harassment. The short-term, medium-term, long-term goal is to prevent those instances from happening within our service, affecting our members. When they do happen to reduce the risk, including the risk of reprisal, and ultimately, for those that have occurred to have timely intake, proper resources assigned, proper investigations and resolutions, including a range of, of resolutions that would go from mediation right through to termination of members. This includes the funding for the contract with Ruben Tomlinson for the pilot project for intake and investigations to be conducted by a third party. This is in support of the joint board and service initiative, co-chaired by myself and chair deans 
to advance this larger strategy in the organization. It is funding to accomplish that priority, and it relates directly to the board's EDI priorities, as well as the health and wellness of our members, two priorities of the board. Uh, the initiative, the long-term goal of the initiative to, uh, to, to place neighborhood officers, is that was the other one you asked for? Uh, the, the mental health actually in particular. Sorry, mental health strategy. Uh, that is a clear uh, statement uh, that we're making in terms of funding uh, and, and joining a large group of community members from across the city to design that strategy. I'm actually gonna turn that portion of the answer over to Deputy Bell to, I, I don't wanna preclude a, a presentation that was coming to the December meeting, but in answer to your question, I think Deputy Bell can talk about the framework of consultation, and then I'll come back and, and conclude the longer term vision of the impact of that investment. Deputy Bell? Yeah, thanks, Chief. Uh, so, Member Suede, where, where we're landing on that or where we're trying to work with our community on that is around bringing uh, to the December board meeting a consultation plan for approval by the board. As we've had in many discussions previously, it's a really important issue to, to look at from a policing perspective to not only be able to address some response to, to crisis response, so how do police better do that? How do we engage our community to help us guide us around that work? But in terms of how we coordinate with a lot of ongoing work that's occurring within our city to make sure that as much as we can, we're addressing upstream issues so that we don't actually ever have that crisis response occur. Um, we've been, been involved with some preliminary discussions with several mental health networks within the city and uh, the resounding um, information we get back is it's going to be vitally important that this isn't an Ottawa police decided, directed and implemented strategy. We need to really make sure that we bring in those community members to help us identify exactly how they can best support us, how we can best respond and what is the best overall strategy for Ottawa police moving ahead as we work in the mental health crisis response, as well as mental health um, coordination and access to services that exist in our community. Um, what we will be bringing to you in December is a multi-point uh, consultation plan for you to approve that will actually build the framework around how we conduct those consultations, how we bring in um, both mental health service providers, but the larger community, uh, advocates, people that suffer from mental health uh, issues, as well as anyone in the general public that wants to provide us information and input around how we can actually respond to this. Um, we're, we're being very deliberately intentional in taking this to the community, listening to our community because they've been loud and clear with us that police organizations of the past have very actively jumped to conclusions and jump to exactly what they want to do to implement. And that's not going to work in this. We need to actually make sure it's a, a whole of service, whole of city approach in terms of how we best respond to it. So I'm looking forward to coming to you in, in December at the December board meeting to share more information and seek your approval on how we conduct that consultation. Thank you, uh, Steve and, and members, wait, if I could just add the, the longer term vision. Um, We'd like to be involved less and less in all aspects of this, except where the police are most needed and still necessary, particularly around those responses where there is clearly uh, at the start of it or at any part of it, an element of violence or criminality. Uh, the best models that we've seen anywhere in the world from Scotland to, to the Cahoots model in Eugene, Oregon, still have a component of police response, significantly reduced, far more integrated across the, spool, the full spectrum, far more focused on prevention and health outcomes that preclude the, the, necess the necessity to even reach out to healthcare providers or certainly emergency service providers. We anticipate, we can't, we can't guarantee, but we anticipate a, redu a reduction in the demand of police services, a transition of that demand to other civil society actors from the not-for-profit to the inst healthcare institutions. And at that point, we can absolutely consider what a resource redeployment would look like as we shift that demand factor. But ultimately this must be designed and led by the community, supported by the service, where we still are able to complete our responsibilities, but we're able to make a broader contribution uh, to the overall strategy. So Chief, is it fair to say that in the long term, uh, when this strategy evolves and develops, that funding would shift away from the police to these other organizations? 
assuming everything goes well? I think on two fronts. Uh, if the demand shifts, the resources should shift. If the demand increases for a whole bunch of reasons, another, another pandemic COVID, another op version of opioid, we can anticipate a range of healthcare challenges. Um, however, the demand increases, the resources should go in that direction. Our goal is to get ourselves out of the level of service provision that we're playing right now and have played for decades. There isn't a police chief in Canada that I know that wants to continue to maintain the current levels of service delivery around mental health and addictions. And there are a variety of efforts across this country, uh, some of them more mature than others. Our intent is to learn from those efforts nationally and internationally to inform our efforts here, but our goal is to reduce the demands that we are currently delivering on and enable other areas to pick them up, including the resources to deliver on them. Off the top of your head, Chief, do you know a jurisdiction in Canada that's currently doing that? Pretty well everyone, including us here. In fact, the mental health unit that we're working on here is an example of reducing demand factor on us. But the best examples or some of the better examples are in Vancouver, Edmonton right now. Uh, we know that Toronto Police Service are looking at embedding a mental health practitioner uh, within their communications operations center to do triage and prioritization right at source. So there's a number of working models that are picking up on best practices and we would be looking at all of them, but looking to customize it here. And ultimately when I say we, under the guidance and leadership of the broader community. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Member uh, Sueda, Member King. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Deans. And I did have a few questions uh, for uh, Mr. Letourno. Um, I guess just to um, really reiterate the, the point made uh, by uh, Member Suiza, um, I wanted to just confirm that uh, the $8.8 .8 million is uh, what is necessary in terms of an increase to meet statutory uh, employment obligations and collective agreement uh, increases. Um, just want to confirm that. Yes, I can confirm that. Okay. And the other key uh, point is uh, if the board uh, decided to create uh, a task force um, that seeks a 2022 budget, uh, really that would uh, have and would ultimately see no increase uh, to, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> to the overall budget in, in 2022. Uh, what would that look like in terms of uh, interfacing uh, with city staff? And what would the implications of that be um, in terms of um, the uh, statutory obligations that, that we have? Um, well, in terms of interfacing with city staff, I think uh, it, there, there wouldn't be an impact. We, we work quite closely with city staff in, in terms of the budget development process. So, so that, that work would, would continue uh, as it currently does. Um, in terms of um, impacts on the organization, um, as the board is in collective bargaining with, with both associations right now, it would depend on the outcome of, 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 uh, of bargaining. Um, but if we look at past, um, uh, if we look at past um, history um, and you make some reasonable provisions uh, for salary increases, um, you could assume that um, that uh, you'd be looking at something something similar in in the range of a nine to ten million dollar increase in in 2022 related to uh, statutory increases associated with a reasonable provision for, for for wage increases. So that's what you'd be looking at in terms of um, if you were looking at a freeze per se in 2022. Um, there, there you'd be looking at uh, at in the, in the ten ten million dollar range uh, of, of solutions. In, in terms of the uh, board, uh, its uh, jurisdiction, the way it's constituted, um, we would have the authority uh, to create this task force and to obviously include uh, city staff, the uh, chief of police, and uh, potentially uh, members of the public. Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other questions? Member Smallwood. Thank you very much. Um, I want to 
just go back to something that uh, Councillor Brocklington said earlier, and, and I think certainly resonates. And it's kind of on the bigger picture thing, and certainly the chief has, has touched on it as well, um, about redefining what police are doing. And I think, Chief, you've talked about that. I There's something, I think, fundamental that, that we should be, I mean, words matter, and the way the budget comes forward to the public and the and our board matters. The, the budget, uh, one of the things in it that has always concerned me, and I know I've spoken to the uh, our chief administrative officer about this before, is the 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 use of a of a uh, chart which shows a cop to pop ratio, and I I'm concerned about it because in this year's budget there's a reference to how our numbers are steadily eroding. And that gives the impression that, that that's a negative and that, that a positive thing would be that we were hiring more police officers. And that really flies in the face of the discussion we're having. It flies in the face of where I think policing is going. And I think it, 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 um, it implies that somehow or other that, uh, that success is determined by additional police officers on the street. And I would think that for all of our, for all of us, for all of our communities, success is actually determined by a lack of crime, by a reduction in need for policing, and uh, seeing more police officers in the street isn't isn't something that we should be aiming for. And I, I'm concerned that that we seem to be saying one thing and then, but we but. Under, underlying that is a, is a force and a direction that's going opposite to that. And that concerns me. And I think as well, I would, I would like to, to think that when we talk about the, the growth officers that we've been talking about now, um, you're, the chief is absolutely right. These are priorities for the board and they are directions we want to go in. And I'm hoping that uh, to a certain extent, some of this, that we would be working towards um, a reallocation of resources internally, and I think the chief has alluded to this, that we would accomplish these, these board priorities, not necessarily by hiring more sworn officers, uh, certainly if that's necessary, so be it. We have an additional number of officers every year that turn over. We have growth officers, but we also have replacement officers. And I would like to think that within those replacement officers, we may be able to be getting the 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 uh, requirements the the, the skill sets that the chief has referred to with respect to the board's priorities, so that maybe that uh, we can be looking at uh, instead of hiring additional growth officers, we're looking at outreach into the community and seeing how we can uh, provide. The, uh, whether it be the police or it be the police supporting some other external independent group, we could be supporting what I think we all acknowledge is, is critically required, which is mental health outreach, uh, crisis response, things, things that, that I think have been clearly identified as, as really not what the police are best trained to do. So I think that's a fundamental direction that, that I hope we are embracing. And with respect to, to Councillor King's comment, I was planning on putting a motion forward that we look at a freeze for the 2022 budget. And my thought would be that uh, I know that uh, that uh, CAO Letourneau has talked about a pressure, but once again, I'm hoping that we can look at um, some of this being addressed through an, a reduction in the, in the needs for new hires. So we remove that budget pressure and looking at a reallocation of resources internally. So I think these things are doable, but I think we should never lose sight that our goal should be community safety and well-being, and that it's what we're really looking for is an absence of crime. However, we can best direct the resources to achieve that. That's my comment. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Member Smallwood, Member Johnson. Uh, Chief, yes. One, one second. Chief, did you want to respond to that? Is that why your hand's up? Yeah, I'm learning how to use the technology better these days, Chair, okay. and thank well, you. Then I'll call you Member Johnson. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for your patience, uh, Member Johnson. Chair, thank you. Uh, uh, Member Smallwood, thank you for your comments. 
Uh, first of all, let me just recognize um, uh, your comments around the what's commonly known as a cop to pop um, uh, stat. Um, uh, actually, uh, it's actually more accurately reflected as member to population stat because the statistic actually is calculated by the total number of members as opposed to just the officers. But your point is valid. Uh, and language is powerful. And, and if we have incorrectly used language, and let me just state clearly, uh, it is an observation of a trend as opposed to a statement that we need to reverse the trend. Um, I will say, though, that as these are more effective numbers, as we've gone through this last fiscal year, and in my 13 months here in office and with the support of my command team, and literally across the entire service, including our community partners, we have gone from roughly 10 to 12 neighborhood officers to 80 at the end of the year. Um, that is a significant redeployment within the organization to create a significant operational model that is focused first on prevention, second on partnerships that extend that prevention capability to actually advance the community safety well being uh, goals. Um, it moves us from a reactive model to a more proactive model. We're in partnership with community and working in community, we have the best chance to improve relationships with the community to earn the trust and respect of the community. And as I've canvassed within the community and as I've canvassed within the police service, in fact, that redeployment and significant growth, that major change in the operating model has been one of the distinguishing factors of the reduction in violent crime, particularly gun and gang related crime shootings and homicides in the city, which is unique amongst major cities in Ontario and one of the most unique across Canada. The other distinguishing factor is that almost 30% of the crime guns that have been seized this year came from the community calling us, not from us finding those crime guns, the trust and faith in the community that they should be part of a co-production of public safety. They should have the confidence to call the police and expect that the police will come and receive these dangerous items, remove them from the street. It is a combination of the change, significant change in our operating model, the significant change in the deployment of our, particularly our police resources, the embedding them in communities where they have enough time and opportunity to earn the trust of the community and to engage them in that co-production partnering role. That is why we're seeing such substantially different operational outcomes, safety outcomes, community safety and well-being outcomes. I referenced this at the last board meeting. We've had a five-year low, five-year half-decade low for shootings, a five-year half-decade low for homicides, an almost 100% clearance rate of the homicides that we've had by way of arrest, which includes the community support in achieving those arrests of those violent individuals. And we've had a five-year high in terms of the crime guns seized through a combination of our investigative units, our frontline neighborhood resource teams, and frontline officers, as well as the community themselves, literally in equal proportions, 33, 33, 33. That is a major change that has happened in the last year. And this budget that we're presenting allows for a significant level of investment to achieve significantly changed and better outcomes as a result of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief. And Member Johnson, over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to um, just comment about the nearly 100 people we heard speak at our meeting last night. And um, their words were very impactful to me. And I've thought a lot about it today and I've looked through my eight pages of notes I took and I have spoken to other board members and to our chair and you know, to Chief Slowly and to other people. And we were all, uh, it has impacted us all. We're all thinking about it and your words matter. What you said, your experiences you shared and um, I want to thank you. Thank you all for taking the time to do that. And um, one of the, you know, ideas that's come in discussion today is that the board would really like to, with the support of a mediator, 
try to restore our relationship with the community. So emotion will follow, but, but I thought that was one of the more important things I wanted to say today. So, so we, take, we take what we all heard last night and um, we'll learn from that. We'll have a mediator help us. And uh, I think that's gonna be a very important process for all of us to go forward, but I think that motion will come later. Am I correct, uh, Chair, Chair Deans? The motion comes later. Okay. I'm going to to introduce the motion when we get to the motions at this point. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, this motion is part of really, you know, a, an a potential amendment to, to um, you know, have this process. Excuse me. And it's part of the process of having these voices, the mediation, and then that would be part of uh, going forward uh, on uh, the um, deployment uh, model. Um, so, so, so that input is part of it. Part of this. Um, so again, that would come in a motion that that. Um, you know, there's a consultation as a result of this mediation, and there's a consultation with the board so that this input can, can be part of this. Um, and I guess my final is really a question to the chief actually, just, just to um, update me on the, the kind of diversity that is coming into our uh, new hires. Because that diversity and that inclusivity, that that more equitable police force will change our culture here at the Ottawa Police Service. So, uh, Chief, can I ask you about that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Johnson. First of all, let me uh, echo your comments at the start before I turn things over to CAO Laterno to walk through uh, what that next class will look like, uh, as well as to give an update of our year-to-date hiring. But let me echo your, your sentiments. Um, this has been a uniquely challenging year. Um, the budget process has been uniquely challenging. Um, and the expressions that we've had over the course of the year around policing, around society, and the expressions that we've had over the course of the budget process have been deeply impactful, deeply meaningful. I think they've affected, and I feel reasonably confident to speak broadly uh, about my command, uh, the members of the Ottawa Police Service, they have caused a great deal of introspection, a great deal of revisiting the core of our calling to this profession. And it is a noble profession, but one that needs major reform and advancements. But it has caused us to think deeply about who we are, what we do, and how we can do it better. And maybe most importantly, how we can do it better with the community. Every one of us like you were riveted to all the different delegations, all of them, as well as the many, many, many other consultations that took place across this city of a million people, the largest municipality in Canada over the course of the full year since the last budget was approved. And we are committed to doing the best we can with the people that have come forward to making those necessary changes. But thank you for raising it and we've, you have our full support. The board has our full support to move this forward. I'm going to ask the CAO to, to speak to uh, the actual stats that we've, we've accomplished so far this year, as well as the, 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 the quality and the diversity anticipated in the next class we're hiring. Thank you, Chief. I'm um, really happy to, to do this. It's, it's a significant success story. Uh, the outreach recruiting team uh, implemented a new process effective uh, January 1st remove significant, significant barriers from the application process, um, which, which resulted in a, a significant 400% uh, to, be, to be exact increase in the, in the applicant pool in terms of quantity, um, but also and even more important, a significant increase in, uh, in both diversity and quality of, um, of, of applicants. Um, in terms of 2020 hiring, uh, the service hired 96 new recruits 33% were female, 
35% were racialized and we had 3% were, were indigenous. Um, and in terms of um, the, the quality of the applicants, um, um, we're talking about very high, highly educated uh, with, uh, with university and, uh, and, and post-secondary degrees, um, but also, and even more importantly, um, the experience and work experience, uh, life experience and volunteer experience is, uh, is, is, is off the charts. Um, we're talking about applicants that have experience working um, with, um, with, with uh, community housing, youth services, outreach services, distress center, uh, mental health services, uh, youth services. So um, the quality and quantity uh, and diversity of the applicants, uh, the new recruits hired this year, and that's a total of 96 uh, is exceptional. And the outreach recruiting team is, is working hard um, on, uh, on their 2021 classes. Okay. Jeff, can you give a quick overview of the class that we'll be bringing into PDC this week? What are the, uh, of the 48 there? Can you break down some of the stats there? Um, Chief, I, uh, I, I don't actually have those numbers right in front of me. I can, I can find them very, very, very quickly. I apologize. Um, um, in term, but in terms of overall, in terms of the 96, we're talking about 33% female, 35% racialized and 3% indigenous. Um, I can I can track those numbers down very quickly um, um, and and, uh, and and answer them shortly. Okay, Member Johnson will provide that information shortly for the class that's coming in this week. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Member Johnson. Uh, Member Meehan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll make this brief. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but um, I would I would just like to highlight. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, we, I think we as a police board um, work as hard as we can and do on these issues is because we care. Um, I, I can only speak on behalf of myself, but I think we live in a wonderful community and the police are needed. That said, we recognize that things have to change. That's one of the reasons that we've undertaken the task and we've taken this budget very seriously, but as, um, as a member, I am heartened by the fact that we are addressing many of the changes that I certainly uh, thought needed to be addressed when I joined the board. Um, there were, I felt there we were doing some things not right, and, and I'm so pleased that she slowly has initiated so many things that I think are going to make a difference in our city. Um, I don't like to think of us hiring more police officers, but as a representative of a suburban community where the, there, there really is an absence of police officers, the community is demanding more police officers. Um, I would love to see traffic maybe dealt with with a, a specialized force that are not uniformed formed officers, but that again is in the provincial purview. Um, but it is an idea that we have been discussing and trying to see if we can change. Um, so we're, we're dealing with all kinds of ideas and different solutions to uh, what we think is a, a burden on, on the police budget. We're trying to bring it down. Um, so I would hope that people recognize that what we're doing here today is not easy. We recognize that change is necessary. We're taking the steps, but to just um, throw this budget out when so many good things are in it, uh, we're going to be bringing amendments today to maybe uh, to make some changes to to what we're going to be doing. But I would just ask people to please be patient with us. I believe we're really on the right track. But we hear people, we hear you, we know what has to change, and we are willing to do it. But this kind of change is going to take time. And I'm just asking people to please uh, be respectful and know that we are we are listening, we are responding. And uh, some of the things that you're asking us to do is just not within our jurisdiction, like keeping police officers on who have, you know, are undergoing investigation. That's not within our power. We cannot let these officers go. We probably would, I think, if we, if we could. Uh, we've asked the province to give us those powers. Okay, um, that's all I'm saying here tonight, but uh, we are committed to change. And, uh, but just throwing this budget out now when we're, we've instituted, we're bringing in, I think what will be concrete change, I think is premature. Um, we have a good force. We have a lot of good people in that police force here. The police, I say force, but the police service here. 
and they need our support too. We're trying to support the community and the police force, the police service is trying to, com com to convince, to support us as well. I'm sorry, I'm really emotional right now, but there's a lot of things going on in the city that's making it very challenging. It's a challenging time for everyone. And I just hope that we can get each other's backs here. Um, we're in this together. We're in a challenging, difficult, tense time. And we're not gonna achieve anything if we continue to fight with each other. We're listening, I'm listening. I know what I do wrong. I admit when I make mistakes. But joining this police board has not been a mistake and I'm glad and proud to be part of it. And um, whatever happens here tonight, know that we will continue to work on your behalf. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Member Meehan. Um, Chief Slowly, I saw your hand up a minute ago. Did you want to comment on something before I uh, move on? Uh, it was actually, um, we're still uh, getting that uh, final set of um, uh, responses for Member Johnson, but I, I, I do want to echo um, uh, Councillor Meehan's comments. Um, you know, when, when you unpack a lot of what we have heard along the way in this difficult year and in this difficult budget process, there's more common ground. Um, uh, it sometimes feels like we're, we're choosing a battleground when we actually have common ground. So I'll just echo those comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Letourneau, you wanted to uh, follow up with the answer to Member Johnson's question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I did have that information, which is filed in a cabinet. Um, so the Chief asked me to expand on the most recent class of recruits that were hired in December. Uh, the, there's a total of 48 that were hired, 50% uh, racialized, 40% female, and 3% Indigenous. Um, as mentioned, it's a very, very, very significantly uh, highly educated, uh, diverse, diverse class. 22 of the 48 are bilingual and speak um, speaking French and English, uh, with an additional 23 uh, languages being spoken by the recruits, including American Sign Language, Arabic, Arabic, uh, uh, Bangla, Cantonese, Creole, Hindi, Kishwahili, Lingala, Luganda, Mohawk, Polish, Punjabi, Romanian, Somali, Spanish, Swahili, Taiwanese, Mandarin, Tagalog, Tamil, Turkish, and Urdu. Um, 34 of the 48 speak uh, additional languages. And in terms of educational attainment, um, 15 have university degrees only, 14 have university and college degrees, and 19 of the 48 uh, have a college di a diploma only. So as, as mentioned, an extremely diverse um, and highly competent class of recruits that, uh, that are gonna be hired in, in December. Can I just add on, I know we're, we're sort of still um, answering questions that were previous. I'm not aware of, and I stand to be corrected, but I'm not aware of any police service anywhere in Canada that has hired a class of that size with that diversity or quality. That is proof positive of massive changes that have under, been undertaken in the last 18 months, particularly in the last 12 months. And we did that in one of the toughest environments that we've ever seen in the modern age in 2020. Despite the challenges and the need for improvements in the Ottawa Police Service chair and board, the Ottawa Police Service is seen as an employer of choice. For people seeking a career in policing, and for people seeking to work in an environment and in an occupation where they can make a difference in the lives of a million people in the nation's capital. I don't wanna go on too much further, but if we were to talk about the number of applicants and the diversity and the quality that went into the civilian hires that we've done this year, you would see a similar level of quality, quantity and diversity. And so yes, we need to change and there's definitely areas for improvement. But this is still an organization that attracts some of the best, brightest, most diverse talent in the city, in the eastern region, and from around the country. Okay. Okay. And thank you, Jeff. That does answer my question. And I think there is value to the diversity, the equity. And I think on its own, it will bring change. So I, I that gives me uh, sort of maybe hope's not quite the right word. Oh, well, hope for more change, actually. Yeah, so that's fantastic. Thank you, that answers my question. 
Thank you, uh, Member Johnson and um, Member Meehan and Mr. Letourneau. And I see Member Sueda would like to ask another question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Actually, uh, not more, not of a question, just more of an expansion uh, to what Member Meehan <clears throat> mentioned. Um, you know, I, I want to thank all the delegates for their time yesterday in the past several weeks, you, Chair, the Board, and the Chief, and the entire OPS. This has been a very difficult deliberation process. One delegate yesterday really struck a chord with me when she was speaking about her kids and her friends' kids. It became real for me. It made me think about my family and what I would do for them. My daughter saw me struggling with the decisions that we're, that we're faced with. And she came in and gave me a kiss and said, I love you, daddy. We're, we're all a family here. There's a lot of emotions and passion. It's truly humbling to see how passionate members of the public have been fighting for what they believe in. The courage they have to speak their truths and their experience, no matter how difficult it was for them, tells me how strong they really are. They are really definitely heroes and I respect that. I've only been on the board since March, but after the last several weeks, I can see that a lot of issues were raised that have been going on for a long time. The hurt has been going on for a long time. Many areas of our civil society have failed to address the many upstream systemic issues like affordable housing, mental, issues, mental illness, and racial issues. This has led to where we are today. This is not one person's problem or entity. There's not one person or entity to blame. We are all to blame. I've gone to know many people on this board and OPS this past year. I have known Chair Deans for many years. I know because of all the hurt that is burning inside you, it's hard to think that the board and the OPS have your best interest in mind. But I wanna say that everyone is really trying. I consider our city one family. And just like, I've, like, just like how I fight with my siblings, our citywide family fights. It is not, but it is out of love and compassion that each of us can find a better way forward to address these issues. I wanna to say to all the public delegates that I, that I have heard your pain and I'm feeling it. I commit to you as a member of the board that I will be pushing your feelings forward and pushing the OPS to continually improve the service that they deliver and to make meaningful changes to address your feelings. I do believe there's a role for police in civil society. I know some delegates have mentioned that they are afraid to call the police. The police are always there for us 24 seven, even when we don't see it. And especially through the tough times. They are not perfect, none of us are. I wanna personally reach out to the organizations that have spoken to try to find a way forward for constructive betterment of our family. I am always accessible. The consideration during this budget process has not come easy for me, but I believe in our chief and I believe the board has made an excellent decision with him. This was the first step in achieving the change that is sought after. Chief, I know you are dealing with many issues and I know you are giving it, all, giving it your all, just as the community is dealing with many issues and they are giving it their all. I am asking you and all members of the OPS to give a little more to address the many issues that so passionately have been discussed. I promise I will. I wanna thank you and all the members of the OPS for their service. May God bless you. God bless all the delegates that are hurting. Better days will come. Keep speaking your truths. Thank you. Unmute yourself, Diane. Sorry, thank you, uh, Member Sweda, Member Nerman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I will be brief and I would like to echo what Member Meehan and Member Sweta has recently said. Uh, I want to assure all the member of the community, the service that we are here to work collectively for common goal and not against each other. I can assure and swear that we are listening and doing whatever is constructive for the community, 
for our service members and all the stakeholders. Thanks to all the members of the community, the service, for your immense support and keeping, keeping us all under check. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Nerman, Member King. Thank, thank you, Chair Deans. I'd like to uh, associate my comments uh, uh, with uh, those that have been uh, made, especially concerning um, the uh, number of delegates who came out uh, yesterday. Uh, we did uh, hear from, from them and we did uh, feel uh, their pain. Um, as a new member of the police board, it is my intention to work to improve the strategic direction of the police service. And I opted to join this board. Uh, the uh, mayor graciously um, surrendered his seat to me uh, so that uh, uh, we could undertake uh, work at this table um, just last month in order to pursue a sustained commitment to greater investments in equity and diversity at the police service, primarily to address the challenge of systemic racism. As we know, the police service has proposed to undertake a restructuring exercise focused on inclusion through improved hiring and by working to incorporate a whole of service approach concerning issues of workplace harassment, um, discrimination and human rights. The service has also committed to work towards the transformation of emergency mental health crisis response through an independent consultative process that would be inclusive of community and social services organizations. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is key to modernizing this police service and it's the central theme driving this budget. And I would acknowledge uh, the, the work uh, that uh, the staff has done to, to, to uh, make that happen and uh, the work that uh, she slowly has done to make that happen. And, and obviously uh, this, this is important, um, the, the idea that we are, are seeking modernization uh, through uh, this budget process. But in order to achieve uh, these objectives, the police service must have an enhanced level of trust with the community that it serves. I believe that there was a serious erosion of trust with the Black and Indigenous communities last weekend. While I did not formally sit down with community members on the weekend, I have been holding informal discussions with community members since and formally listened diligently to them yesterday along with the rest of the board. In order to achieve overarching and realistic changes, the police service will require not just the appropriate financial resources to undertake modernization, but underlying support from the racialized communities that will be the ultimate beneficiaries of that work. It will be impossible to address systemic issues that exist within the police service if there is that trust. I supported the budget direction at council because of a need to reimagine the role of the police, which includes a sustained commitment to equity. However, it will be necessary for us to prioritize community dialogue through the Community Equity Council and other third party mediated public consultation processes at the board to build an enhanced level of public trust before the service moves ahead to implement its proposed work. As a consequence, I believe it is incumbent upon us to continue to listen to the community to enhance the vision outlined in the budget and to ensure that is adequately informed by community voices especially the idea of strategically detasking police services to transform the service to address community safety and well-being. <clears throat> Ultimately, I do know that there are motions that are before us that will examine um, the creation of task force and also a motion that, that I had advanced uh, to ensure greater community input, and I will be supportive of those. But I do believe it is incumbent upon us to continue to listen to the community, to enhance the vision outlined in the budget, and, and to ensure that we are adequately listening to those voices. So my preference at this time would be to meet statutory employment obligations and collective agreement increases that we have really no control over and that are a statistical requirement or, or a, 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 a statutory requirement, but put a hold on expenditures and increases there uh, until there is wider public consultation. 
Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, thank you, Councillor King. I, I just want to be clear what we're talking about here. Um, we heard from Jeff Letourneau. I mean, there was a bunch of numbers, so, uh, um, but we heard that the statutory requirements are $11.3 million and growth is 1.7, I believe. And then there were some uh, other costs. Um, and I, I just not entirely sure what number it is you're looking for. I'm thinking it is that pool of money the $3.9 million that goes to the new recruits. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about that motion a little bit because yesterday I introduced a motion that would effectively ask the, um, instead of going ahead with the new hires to come back uh, to this board and provide a, a change that would look at a hiring other than just sworn officers, but a, um, um, a selection of maybe mental health workers or youth workers or whatever in consultation with the community that seemed appropriate. Um, but I heard an answer from Chief Slowly that kind of confused me a little bit because he seemed to enumerate how all of those 30 sworn officers would be deployed into the organization. and. I'm, I'm not seeing it. I think my colleagues aren't exactly seeing that that's what we would do with those 30 sworn officers, that in fact, they might not be 30 sworn officers. So can you just clarify for this board, um, um, if, if you're saying, if, if this motion that I put yesterday didn't pass, that's what you would do with the money, but um, if it does, then you would uh, pivot? Chair, is that a question for me? It is. Yeah, uh, Chair, I, I, was, I guess I'm relying on process. I thought we couldn't speak to your motion until it was formally time to do so. So until it was adopted, then I could speak to it. I, I'm, I'm in your hands as to how you well, want to do it. Once it's adopted, it's too late. I mean, we can go through, there's a number of motions. We can take them one by one, but um, Councillor King raised this as sort of a pivotal piece for him in supporting the budget. And I think it's pivotal to all of these um, board members who see, have heard loud and clear the calls for change and want to demonstrate the commencement of that change process through um, not just hiring new sworn recruits. So if we are to pass the motion um, that uh, is on the table for deliberation tonight, then you would be pulling back what you um, described earlier and um, going to a new process. Am I correct about that? I'd be willing to examine what's in that motion, yes, uh, that we would look at ways, instead of just going with officers, looking at combination of officers and civilians, and even within civilians, I know Member Meehan talked about uh, uh, different models that are used in different jurisdictions where non-police officers, in this case, special constables, would be used in traffic enforcement as they do in the province of Alberta uh, for pay duty and, and public order events like they do in Vancouver, uh, for general patrol, bylaw, neighborhood response as they do in Toronto, and the actual use of civilians, civilians who are trained in mental health, social services, youth outreach, as they did in the original neighborhood policing model, which I looked at way back in 2005 and six in the UK, uh, yes, we're open to all those constructs around which we can create a different police service, a different looking police service, a different operating police service that produces different and better outcomes in and with community. Absolutely very interested in exploring that. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, um, Okay, and then and we. Chair, oh. Sorry, I, I am raising my hand if, if you permit me. Um, I would also be curious, and I don't know if this is the right time to uh, uh, speak to this, but in terms of the motions, the, uh, the costing of, of the motions, and, and asking uh, Mr. Letourneau uh, whether uh, these motions uh, could uh, be accommodated in terms of uh, the, the dollar amounts <clears throat> if we were to constrain. 
uh, the uh, growth just to our statutory obligations. Okay, so uh, Mr. Letourneau, could you answer that question? So the question was, I'm sorry, I'm just clarifying here. The question was all of the new motions that are on the table, can we, af can we afford those uh, if we constrain the um, growth, sorry, the increase for 2021 to just the statutory, um, the statutory increases? Is That's correct. Okay. That's the so before I am, well, so, um, we would have we would have some work to do to find um, if if if, uh, if I'm if I'm if I'm reading these correctly um, in terms of the the the, um, the new motions the only thing I see from an incremental cost perspective is the one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars for a community partnership fund. So um, that is something that we would have. We would have a little bit of work to do to find uh, some money to 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 cut in the in the base budget in order to, to find that. But I'm quite confident that we would be able to do it. I can't point to the exact line item uh, right now, uh, but uh, I'm quite confident that we would be able to find um, a reduction um, in the professional services uh, base budget to be able to fund that. Um, in terms of uh, your your comments about the statutory. Um, statutory increases, I, I just wanna make sure we, we clarify what that means. Um, what we would be looking at would be um, um, all of the maintain services line, which is $11.3 million. Um, plus there would be another $1.7 million required for um, the previous year's growth hiring. So that brings the increase to $13 million. $13 million. Um, and so you'd be reducing um, $2.2 million based on uh, uh, removing the full 30 growth from 2021. You'd be removing $900,000 or $800,000 from the, the new services line item as well. So that's the mental health uh, funding, the sexual harassment project funding, and the additional de-escalation project funding for a reduction of, of $3 million based on what's been what's been tabled. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Chair. Okay, so, um, okay. Um, so um, there was a question, I can't remember who asked it now, but it was about, working toward a zero-based budget in 2022. Um, am I to understand that that would be about $10 million? Is that, was that your answer, Jeff? And Mr. Letourneau, if we were to, um, if we were to work toward that for 2022? You would be. Uh, Chair, uh, sorry, uh, Chair, that was that was my proposal about the zero-based budgeting approach. Uh, when we do that uh, consultation, public consultation for the next year budget, uh, we should commence it from the considering a zero-based uh, budgeting approach. I don't know if anybody else has also raised that. Okay, I just want to understand that we would be then looking for a reduction of ten million dollars. Is that correct? Yeah, it's actually a little higher than that. I apologize. That ten million was wages um, when you when we add the inflation uh, on um, on existing contracts and services, um, you'd be looking more like eleven uh, eleven and a half million dollars. Okay, and if we were to implement a new mental health strategy and started handing off resources to a third party that would respond to some of the mental health calls instead of police. Does that sound possible that we could get there in 2022? Here, I'll, I'll just, uh, it's, it's an important question you're asking, I understand that. Uh, without understanding what the design will be, what the process of implementation and evaluation would be. And again, uh, we're doing our best to not, not sketch that out and leave that out. Um, we're trying to let the community 
and the, and the mental health community in particular lead that out. So could we anticipate uh, after a, after some portion of next year, an implementation that starts to see demand shift, that there could be a reduction in cost? Yes, that's a reasonable anticipation, but I think it's way too early and way too presumptuous for us to, to anticipate whether or not that would substantially eliminate the 10, $11 million that, uh, that so far we've been able to identify as a pressure. Okay, but that is something that the board could perhaps ask the FAC committee to um, start uh, forming a working group to start looking at how we might get to that for 2022. I mean, here's the thing. We heard a lot of impassioned pleas last night uh, from people whose lived experiences have been very difficult and who want to see a change. And I think that um, those voices were amplified, but they're echoed by a broader community of support that recognize that we need to modernize the police service in this city and that we need to start working quickly towards significant change. And I, you know, we have been, I think, through the sexual violence and harassment work, the mental health strategy, the motion that we did to the province, uh, asking to be able to dismiss people for egregious uh, crimes that are still on the payroll of police through the review the board is doing on the workplace, uh, on the um, uh, uh, use of force dynamic entry uh, review. All of those things, I think, are adding up to hopefully um, an indication that we want change. We don't want to do business as usual. We recognize that we need to move a long way. And uh, I think every member of this board is dedicated to doing that. And I think one of the things that we want to signal is, even if we're not getting as far as fast this year, as uh, the, the impassioned voices we heard yesterday want us to move, but we still want to go there and we want to get there too. And so, and I think we want to push the envelope and we want to push hard. We, we don't want to do business as usual anymore. We want to push hard to change the way we're doing policing and to make it better. And we recognize that a lot of upstream issues are causing downstream costs, expensive costs in policing. And a police response is not, it's, it's a late in the process response and it's reactive, not proactive. And we wanna to get to a more proactive place as a community. So we recognize that there's a lot of work to be done. It goes way beyond this board. It goes into our funding for mental health and addictions or funding for housing, uh, a lot of other things, lifting up communities in need, uh, all, all of those things. Um, I think the province needs to be much more engaged in mental health strategy than they have in the past. I mean, I think this started 20 years ago when the province made changes to their mental health and put a lot of uh, people suffering from mental health and addictions issues on the street. And we've never really recovered as a community from that, but we need to do a lot more. And I think that uh, we're, we're getting to a breaking point where people want to see that significant change and they want us to lead that change. And I think every member of this board was very impacted by what they heard last night. And I, we all feel an urgency to get on with this. So I think what we're saying is we want to get on with this and we want to signal that we want to get on with this. And what we do tonight is a start for what is coming in the months ahead. And we recognize, I mean, I recognize that getting to the budget day or the day before budget is not when we can make that change. We have to start the day after we pass this budget looking to next year's budget and how we're gonna get there and how we're gonna make that difference. That, that's the time that it takes. It, it's not the, the day before you pass a budget that you can make these wholesale changes. We have to work at that. And I think we wanna signal loud and clear to you that that's where this board wants to take this community. And uh, so, um, and we have a lot of work to do to get there. So um, I think we're going to turn to the motions. Sure, if, I, if I could respond, thank you. Uh, I, I couldn't be more uh, in alignment with what you said. Um, and, and as you were speaking, uh, quite frankly, I was taken back 
to a, a, a warm day in August, uh, sitting in front of yourself, uh, Councillor Meehan, uh, Member Smallwood. There's been a few changes on the board since then. Uh, we were having that same conversation. Uh, you were telling me we're looking for change. The questions were designed to explore my vision for change, my resilience and ability to drive that change, and my commitment to making a commitment to this city, this community, uh, not just a personal professional commitment, but a family commitment. I gave you that commitment. I started working on change from the day that you offered me a contract. I started preparing this organization for the change that we've actually accomplished significantly through the great work of men and women across this service at every rank and in every role through the partnerships that they've had in literally every community across this great city. And I've enumerated some, but not all of the massive changes that have taken place over the last year. Those changes have prepared us for even bigger and deeper and broader changes. We have been working hard to prepare this organization, not just to move forward under our own initiative, but to move forward through the community safety and well-being, through a broader set of partnerships that our neighborhood response teams and crime prevention officers will be able to, to form. There have been other changes at the city. There's a new head of our OC, uh, Ottawa District Carleton School Board. We're having substantive conversations with my colleagues of public sector leaders, Dr. Vera Etches. So this is a change that we've been preparing for within the police service, with our partners, with other leaders in civil society. This budget will allow for greater change, deeper change, broader change, more integrated change. But I share your fierce urgency of now I want it all done yesterday. I'm a realist though, and I've been in this business for a long time. It won't happen yesterday. A lot will happen over the next year. The budget will enable it to happen to a greater degree. And quite frankly, the hard work and dedicated work of compassionate men and women in this police service and their similar desire for a better police service, a better working environment, a safer city, a healthier career. It is driving them to work with me and my command team we have made real change. We will make more real change and we'll do it best with the board and with the community support. We're absolutely committed to that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think what we're going to do now is turn to the motions. Um, so just give me a minute so I can pull them up. I think we'll start with the um, order that we introduced them yesterday. So Councillor King, yours would go first. Um, on the CEC. Would you just like to speak briefly to it? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chair Deans. Um, as many know, I was uh, the inaugural co-chair of the uh, Community Equity Council and uh, uh, know uh, many of the members well, know some of the past members in uh, Compact, which was the predecessor well, and know the demands that are made upon uh, these volunteers. Uh, when they're doing good work consulting the communities in their volunteer capacity. And uh, the challenge, of course, uh, that they have is that they, they are doing outreach, uh, but they don't have the supports. Uh, I know that when I was a, a volunteer on this board, uh, the amount of time uh, that uh, I had to dedicate uh, was, was tremendous. And I think that that needs to be acknowledged in terms of uh, some of the, the resources uh, that uh, CEC members require, uh, such as things like childcare or reliable transportation uh, in order to really uh, uh, fully participate in the CEC or as event participants, uh, the people who come out to uh, these events to, uh, from multiple communities to, to really uh, speak um, and share uh, their experiences and build that better relationship with the police service. So as a result, um, I have uh, uh, introduce this motion. I will uh, read the uh, therefore clauses. Therefore, be it resolved that the Ottawa Police Service allocates an amount no more than 25000 to be funded from existing budgets to support members of the CEC and CEC event participants with reasonable expenses to be determined by the Chief Administrative Officer. And therefore, be it resolved that an accompanying policy for expenses is developed by the CEC to assist with clarifying eligible expenses while still maintaining flexibility. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, Councillor King. I don't see anyone um, looking to speak to this motion. So is this motion carried? Carried. 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 Um, the second motion is a motion that was moved by myself and seconded by Member Johnson. And it talks about the scope of work change that the board is hoping to uh, take on this year. And it is asking for an increase in our professional services budget with one-time funding of $150,000 for the 2021 budget to be funded from existing Ottawa Police Service Capital Works and um, progress budgets in order to allow for the board to take on that um, change of work. And a uh, bit further resolve that where possible, this work is done in consultation and partnership with the police service and external stakeholders in order to avoid duplication of effort and ensure outcomes that best serve the city of Ottawa. Uh, I don't see any hands up to discuss this. So is that motion carried? Got it. Carried. Thank you. And then uh, the next motion also by myself and men member Johnson uh, talks about bringing forward a three year budget forecast. And the notion here is um, to allow us to be a little forward looking and to align with our strategic plan, um, both being three year cycles in order that we can project out or signal at least to the community where we're intending to go in terms of uh, budget allocations. So um, the, therefore be it resolved is that during the 2022 budget development, the Ottawa Police Service built a three year financial forecast that aligns with the strategic plan as approved by the board. Is that motion carried? Got it. Carried. carried. Thank you. Um, and then the next motion, uh, the deployment model for <laughs> community police. Um, just see. And this is the this is the one we've been talking about a lot tonight. Um, I will read. I think I'll read this whole motion. Um, Whereas the OPS and the OPSB are dedicated to making meaningful change and ensuring the police service best reflects the needs of our city. And whereas the Ottawa Police Services Board and the Ottawa Police Service 2021 draft bu operating budget includes funding for the hiring of, of an additional 30 officers. And whereas the OPS has committed to expanding the neighborhood resource teams beyond the urban core to include both and in rural communities. And whereas the OPS and OPSB recognize that communities across Ottawa have needs based on their unique demographics and that deployment models should reflect these differences. And whereas the police board and the service have committed to reviewing and updating policies and procedures related to how OPS responds to calls for service. Therefore, be it resolved that the Ottawa Police Service review how they could use alternatives to sworn officers, including civilians who have suitable expertise, experience, and certification in a variety of areas such as mental health practitioners, social workers, or youth outreach workers to make up deployment teams based on community needs, and therefore be it further resolved that the OPS work in consultation with key community partners to determine where and how these individuals could be deployed to best serve the community, and therefore be it further resolved that the OPS report back to the board with a final plan on how they will leverage civilian members to further further support community policing prior to issuing any offers of employment. And Member Johnson has her hand up. So Member Johnson. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, Sandy and I have a friendly amendment for that. Um, and I'm sorry if there's background noise. I'm having some computer problems here in Canada. So I've got two devices on. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yep. Okay. Uh, so it's to the last, therefore. So our friendly amendment is, therefore, it further resolved that the OPS, in consultation with the Ottawa Police Service Board, and that's really to follow the next motion about the restorative mediation. So we can bring the mediation information to this. So... Um, so in consultation with the Ottawa Police Service Board, who has final approval on this plan, which is the normal process of the board, to leverage uh, um, civilian members to continue and grow the community policing. OK, 
Okay. Sandy, do you have a comment to this as well? So I've just read it, but this was- No, no, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think we wanted to make sure that, that we weren't uh, brought with a fait accompli and had no ability to, to provide input to it. So uh, I think that was the idea of making that change. So it was done in consultation with the board. Okay, and um, Chief Slowly, did you have a comment on that? No, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's well worded. Uh, um, not that you need my agreement, but I think it's well worded and I think it meets both the spirit and the intent of what we're trying to do to create a new organization that delivers um, different and better results. So thank you. Okay, and uh, as the mover of the motion, I presume uh, uh, Delta uh, Member Nerman is the seconder. I'm I, we will accept that as a friendly amendment. So can we carry this motion as amended? Carried. 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 Perfect. Thank you. Um, so now I believe there are more motions. So I remember Johnson, you have your hand up. Do you have another motion? Uh, I do. I hadn't taken it down. Um, yes, this is the restorative mediation motion. Okay. If you could put that up, thank you. Thank you. And, and as I said earlier, but I, I want to highlight it again. This motion is response to the uh, important voices that we value that we heard yesterday, the hundred voices. And there were probably more that uh, weren't able to join. So, so this is in response to this. So I am going to read the whole motion. So it's restorative mediation. Whereas the Ottawa Police Service Board heard from close to 100 delegates at their meeting of November 23rd, whereas many of those who participated spoke to the broken relationship between the BIPOC community and the Ottawa Police Services Board, whereas the board recognizes a need to strengthen their own relationship with the community outside of the Ottawa Police Service, and whereas before taking on consultations with the community or approving policy on issues such as a new mental health response, the review of the use of force policies or the approval of an additional 30 service members, the board must have a solid foundational relationship with these same communities. And as whereas mediation is a practice that can help restore lines of communication and trust between two parties. Therefore be it resolved that the board seek to hire a third party to establish a mediation process with the Ottawa community, specifically those that identify as BIPOC. So this would be moved by myself and seconded by Vice Chair Smallwood. Okay, are there any comments on the motion? <laughs> Member Nerman. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Member Johnson. Uh, I think it's a very, very well motion. But what will be the, I am just curious to know, uh, once we hire that, uh, what will be the budgetary provisions, the limitations uh, for hiring that third, and what will be the mandate of this, uh, all those issues have, can you just enlighten broadly? Um, I would probably need to consult with Jeff to understand the cost of mediation session. So I don't know if he's on here and can perhaps give that uh, CEO. Maybe I can just add that um, I think this is a priority for the board. Uh, I think, you know, how, how wide sweeping this will be and how costly it will be will depend very much on the community's willingness to participate. Um, so um, we just passed a motion that gave the board an extra $150,000 for the change in the scope of work that we're going to do. I'm going to make the assumption that within that new budget envelope that we have, we can accommodate this. And if we can't, we will come back mid-year and ask for some extra funds from the service. But I think we can accommodate it for now. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Is this motion carried? Carried. 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 Are there any other motions? 
as uh, chair. Who said that? It's, uh, this is Robert. Hi, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, I have a motion about the Community Partnership Fund. Okay, go ahead. Um, this is in response to um, what I've been hearing the last several weeks, uh, where it seems that there's been a broken line of communication between the board and members of the community. And I wanted to ensure that these lines of communication get reestablished and strengthened. So I'm putting forward this motion and I'll read it out. Whereas the Auto Police Service Board heard from close to 100 delegates at their meeting on November the 23rd. Whereas many of those who participated spoke to an inability to effectively share their experience and desires with the board. And whereas the board recognizes a need to strengthen their relationship with the community in order to appropriately and accurately reflect their needs in the decisions they make. And whereas community funding is not easily accessible and communities would benefit from a specific stream of funding for police matters. Therefore, be it resolved that the board establish a community partnership fund of $150,000 annual base funding to be funded from existing resources that will seek to support community groups in their efforts to ensure policing in Ottawa reflects the needs of their communities. And therefore, be it resolved that the term of reference for this fund will be created through the board's policy and governance committee. Okay. Um... I'm, I'm the seconder on this motion and obviously agree with it, but I just have one slight issue when, I, when you were reading it, Member Sueda, and that is um, it talks about a, an annual base fund uh, of $150,000, uh, but it says to be funded from existing resources. And this is a board um, partnership. So this implies the way it's worded that um, it comes out of the board based budget. We don't have $150,000. So I think we just have to change this wording um, to say that the this would come from uh, OPS uh, uh, existing resources as opposed to the board resources. So I take it that would be friendly to you. Yes, that's correct. Thank and you for the correction. I, sorry about that. And then I suppose that we would need to ask Mr. Letourneau if this can be accommodated. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, um, um, I, I think I brought that up a little bit earlier. Um, we don't have the line items that we would, <clears throat> we would uh, leverage to find this funding, but I'm confident that we can find the $150,000. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any comments on this motion? Uh, so can we carry that motion? Carried? Carried. 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 Thank you. Are there any other motions? Um, Chair, it's okay. Sandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we had discussed earlier, uh, uh, Councillor King brought up the item, uh, I think, um, Member Nerman had mentioned it, and I just thought uh, it might be helpful if we had a motion uh, which had been discussed to direct the, um, the FAC to, to work towards a, uh, um, uh, a zero increase um, in the uh, 2022 budget. Um, so I can give you a motion to that effect, uh, if that would help. Um, whereas the Ottawa Police Services Board heard from close to 100 delegates at their meeting of November the 23rd, and whereas the, uh, many of those who participated spoke to a desire to see the Ottawa Police budget either frozen or reduced, and whereas the board is determined to bring meaningful change to the Ottawa Police Services and ensuring that it reflects the community that it serves, Therefore, be it resolved that the board ask the Finance and Audit Committee to strike a working group to determine how the 2022 police budget could be reduced or frozen 
at 2021 levels. Is there, so I, oh, did you want to speak to that, Member Smollett? I just wanted to say that I, I realized that after asking Jeff to find all this additional funds, this is kind of like pushing and shoving at the same time or sucking and blowing at the same time. But uh, I do believe that, that this is part and parcel of what we as a board has ta have talked about that um, as you had brought up and mentioned, we are looking at a new way. And I think this would be one of the indications that we're serious about uh, redressing the way we, we provide service to the community. Thank you. And I, I do believe that the time to start working on a significant change budget is now. So I think this is the appropriate time to signal that that is the direction we would like to take the police service. And so I think it's appropriate that we carry this uh, motion. So um, can we carry that motion? Carried. 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 Um, are there any other motions? Seeing none, just give me a second. Okay, just have to scroll through my notes here. Um, So we're now to the budget approval. So the, um, I'm just going to ask uh, for this to be carried that the Ottawa Police Services Board one, approve the 2021 draft operating and capital budgets and two, direct the executive director to forward the budgets to city council for approval. Is this item carried? And, and Chair Deans, I uh, unfortunately will uh, dissent on this, uh, on this item. Okay, and um, we will record that dissent. Uh, is the item carried? Carried? Carried. Okay. Carried. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who participated in uh, the budget 2021 process. We appreciate all of the input from the community that we received uh, and we will continue to work hard uh, in the coming year to do even better next year. Um, so I believe that is the end of the public portion of the meeting. We're now going to move in camera. Um, so can I have a motion uh, to move in camera? Member Sueda, would you like to move that? Moved. And seconded by Member Nerman? Yes, I second it. Thank you. Carried? Carried. Carried. So um, board members, I'm going to, it's 10 after seven, um, let's say 7.25, we will resume in camera to consider our in-camera items. So thank you everyone again.